actually tell you that I am actually standing in front of our chairman, Tony King, who wasn't able to speak today because he's doing a study tour in, uh, in northern Italy. And also our ex-chairman, Anthony Passmore, was also able, not able to come today because he's on holiday. So first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the group. Um, the group was formed in 2006, but we'll hear a bit more about that later. Um, but before, prior to that, it was known as the New Forest Section of the Hampshire Field Club. And that's, that group had been, going, been in existence since 1961. So the group has been looking at archaeology and history in the forest for a very long time. A lot of the work that we've heard about today has been um, focusing on what's, what happened in the, what's been happening in the current millennium. But this, is, this is going to take you back, some of it, uh, over 50 years to what's happened in the 1960s and 1970s. Unfortunately, I was still at school then, so I, I, wasn't, I haven't taken part in some of the early work. Um, what's, what my talk is going to comprise of is a brief overview of, what the early, of the early work, and then I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about some of the work which I've uh, taken part in, which has been uh, basically since about 2000 and 2004. Uh, <clears throat> so oh, we will fire away, and I will tell you a bit more about this first site, which is something which we've already heard quite a lot about from, from Professor Fulford. Uh, <clears throat> this is a Roman pottery site. Uh, in Slowden, which is actually uh, the adjacent enclosure to Amberwood. Uh, this was excavated in 1966 by Mrs. Swan, and unfortunately never published, which is a bit of a pity. Uh, you can see pretty well the kiln site, the kilns uh, here, the circular kiln as shown in Professor Fulford's drawings and other, other uh, pictures that he showed you. Um, <coughs> this site was actually excavated um, prior to the gravel tracks being laid around, which runs all the way around Slowden, and it was identified by Anthony Passmore before the gravel tracks were laid, and therefore a rescue excavation took place. What I like about this is you can see in the gravel tracks, which are still there today, they were actually constructed from the bomb damaged material. The under, the under part of, the, of these tracks was, was constructed from the bomb damaged material from. Southampton during the Second World War, and they've now become eroded. The gravel on the top has become a little bit eroded, and in places you can see bits of brick and a particularly lovely bit of Victorian tile sticking up underneath this gravel track, which I think sort of takes the archaeology right from the Roman period in Slowden right through to the present day, really. So that's a rather an interesting feature of what, what happened, was happening in Slowden. Now we have another site here, um, which is on Bewley Heath. Um, this as again, another excavation that was done in the early 1960s. Uh, this proved to be uh, a, an, an Iron Age site, which was overlaid by some medieval uh, field boundaries. Uh, this is a good example of how complicated archaeology in the New Forest can be, because you've got different features uh, overlaying on top of one another. So it's, a, it was, it's quite complicated sometimes to unravel what's, what's going on here. Uh, obviously, the lidar, which we will talk a bit, I will talk a bit more about later on, that has been a great help in pinpointing different features and helping to unravel the situation a bit more. This is another um, earthwork system, which is uh, at Horsebush Bottom, and that again shows the complications of, a, of very, very, very many different periods of uh, occupation and work that's been done. You've got a lot of here, we've got what's, what's our field boundaries, and then you've, here you've got a ploughed area, which was actually, this was actually ploughed up during the Second World War, because quite a large parts of the forest were used to produce food during the Second World War. A particular place that springs to my mind is Backley Receded, um, which is up by the A31, as some of you probably know, and that's why it's known as Backley Receded, for that very reason. So you can see this uh, very, very slight earthwork running along here. Now, I'll, another thing I really wanted to talk about at this stage, before I go on to some of the current work that the group's done, Steve warned me not to stand there because it creeps, so I should Over the years, uh, quite a lot of the uh, people who have been pu published some seminar works on the New Forest have been members of our group. Um, obviously, we've already heard from Richard here, and this is one of his publications. 
Colin Tubbs was a member, and he, his, that, his book, The New Forest, still remains one of the seminal works on the ecology and, uh, and of the New Forest. That's really still one of the, one of the big reference uh, tombs that you can use. And then we've also got David Stagg here, who was an archaeological archaeological officer at the Ordnance Survey later on in his career and I know he was a great mentor of Richard's, wasn't he Richard? Yeah. And he was also a member of the group and he published these, so quite a lot of the early documents on the New Forest uh, in conjunction with the Hampshire Record Office. Uh, but a lot, of, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't know that David Stagg actually did quite a lot of survey work as well and this is an early enclosure that he uh, discovered during the early 1980s. And you can see it's not just an enclosure. We've got here, we've got a boiling site here, more about those later on, and also some charcoal, remains of charcoal pits he found to here. So this, this does give you an idea of what, how complex archaeology can be in, in the uh, New Forest and also oh, different site types that you find. <coughs> And this is another early publication by our previous chairman, Anthony Passmore, Verders of the New Forest. And this is a really a history of the New Forest from the late Victorian period up to 1977. Um, he used the Verders papers, which he acquired, I, I don't quite know quite how, but when the New Forest, uh, the Verders Court was reconvened in the late Victorian period, he used the Verders papers to compile this very interesting history of the New Forest. Um, which ends pretty well with the with the gridding of the forest. That's that's where it more or less ends, which is quite interesting. And if you don't know anything about why or how the new forest was gridded, it's a, it's very well worthwhile reading it. I don't. It's it's out of print at the moment, but I think there are still quite a few copies available. As we know, Anthony has done a, a, a great deal of work on the new on the new forest archaeology um, ever since the early 1960s when the group started. Uh, the, there is also the New Forest Research and Publications Trust, which runs in, ran in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the New Forest section of the Hampshire Field Club. And these are, this is a selection of some of the publications that the Research and Publications Trust has produced, all of which you've all seen we have, we have on sale at, out there on our, on our table. And uh, I'm pleased to say that quite a few people have wanted to buy copies, and we will be bringing more tomorrow in case that, that we don't want you to be disappointed. But there's, uh, the, the top one is about the bombing range of Ashley Walk in the north of the forest. Again, New Forest Explodes is, is, is about uh, the, uh, the, the uh, gunpowder and the gunpowder factory at Fritham and also about uh, the gunpowder factory which was at Turf Hill. And then there's Les Gerald LaSalle's 35 Years in the New Forest, which is again a, a very interesting recollections of his. Uh, life as deputy surveyor up until from the late Victorian period up till uh, 1914. I think he he ceased to be deputy surveyor. So bringing it all up to date, we still are doing publications, and this is <coughs> our our photographic copy we have just produced of ancient earthworks of the New Forest to commemorate 100 years since Hayward Sumner published this. Um, there were very, it was a very, very short print run and it's very hard to get hold of and the, the committee particularly felt that it was, it was well worth trying to reproduce it so that people could, more, a, a wider audience could see what Hay Hayward Sum, experience Hayward Sumner's work and I must say that's certainly been true because that's certainly been going off the shelves like hot cakes so the commercial was definitely well worth it so, and we will bring more copies tomorrow if anybody wants to buy one tomorrow. So now... <coughs> This is uh, one of the things I was going to talk about in a bit more detail. This is one of th these are some sites which there are over 200, 600 of these boiling sites which have been found in the New Forest. Um, most of them found by the group uh, it, over, over, over time since it's been in operation. I don't know whether, uh, thinking about Steve's <laughs> diagram about the pyramid, I'm wondering how many people would like me to explain about how a boiling site works, because they are very specific to the New Forest, although they would have been found in other parts of the country. Would, would you like me to explain what's going on here, or would you rather we just moved on? Okay, well, first of all, let me say that boiling sites 
because the New Forest hasn't been under the plough like so much of the country, they, are, they still remain in the New Forest, which is quite unusual. Um, they probably would have been uh, all over the country at one stage, but they've, prob they've been ploughed out. I know that Frank has said that you do find them in Ireland quite a lot, and I've been to Orkney, where there are you can find them, and also know that Shireen here did discover one in North Hampshire, didn't you, quite a while ago. Basically, this is a Bronze Age site, and this is how people... Uh, boiled water in the Bronze Age. What they did was they set a trough quite close to a spring uh, and then the trough would fill with water. They would then um, make a bonfire fairly close by and collect flints and they would uh, throw, put the flints on the bonfire, the flints would heat up, they would throw the, the flints into the water and the water would then heat up from the heat of the stones. Now the, the remaining archaeologists archaeological evidence on the ground is quite ephemeral because all you find is something called burnt or calcined flint and Shireen and uh, Wendy are going to pass around an example of burnt or calcined flint for you all to have a look at so you can see what it looks like. I'm sure some of, there are some people like Dr. Rebel there who know what calcined flint looks like but not everybody does so I thought I'd uh, we, we'd pass it around and so does Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> but there are one or two people who won't know, so I thought it was worth while passing it around, especially as um, uh, I'm Professor Fulford also passed around an example. I thought, well, I'm in good company there if I pass that around. So basically, what you've, all you're going to find really is a, a crescent-shaped um, area of, 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 of this flint. If you excavate, as such as this example here, which is at Millersford Bottom, you will find the remains of the trough encircled by all, these, all this calcined flint. And there are many, many sites to, like this to be found all over the forest if you know what you're looking for, but they're pretty tricky to find. And, not, and they don't show up on the LIDAR, which is one thing that we all know about, <laughs> isn't it? But there we are, that's just the way it is, isn't it? So um, that is what a boiling site is, dates from the, from the Bronze Age. The other thing of, of interest is that there is a lot of debate about what they were used for. Um, some people think that it was for uh, cooking food. Other people think it was a sort of sweat lodge, such as you have in Scandinavia now. And I was told recently by somebody who was explaining to this about, they said, oh, they still do that in Bhutan. They still use that me method of heating water so that they can wash. So maybe it is for, maybe it is for washing, but uh, I'm not sure. I've, the the, the judgment is out for me, definitely. So on the right-hand side, of the slide, you can see this is some experimental archaeology which the group undertook um, probably in the, in the 1990s, I think it was, to try and see how the boiling site would have worked. As you can see, there's some rather peculiar headgear and that was because apparently it got very hot and it was quite tricky to, to um, keep throwing, in your, throwing your stones in. And it was also filmed and occasionally the film does get shown to the group of, of the boiling site the experimental archaeology boiling site in operation. So that's a little bit about boiling sites, and now we will move on to um, <coughs> the Great Stall of 1990, which was mentioned by Steve in, 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 his, in the previous talk. Um, <coughs> a lot of fuss has been made about the, the storm of 1987, because it's the 30-year anniversary over the last few weeks, haven't they? But a lot of people perhaps don't realise that we had another really bad storm in 1990, and that did affect this area probably more, I think, sometimes than, than the, the 1987 storm. And it particularly blew, blew over a lot of trees in Slowden, which you can see here. And as we've already discussed, both by me and by Professor Fulford, there was a, a lot of, this was the main, one of the main areas for the production of Roman pottery. So members of the group decided that it was, it was really a, a wonderful opportunity to find out whether there was any more, there, was, there were, were any more kilns within Slowden enclosure. Um, <clears throat> because what happens is as the tree roots, as the trees fall over, the root place is, is exposed and you can find lots of bits of pottery, for example, at Waster Pottery, which would indicate that there was a kiln fairly nearby or it could even have been on the site of a kiln. Um, <clears throat> so what the group did was they, they went around marking the, tri the stumps of the trees where the, where the trees had blown over prior to, the, to them being sawn up. And, and when, at that time, they would have been uprighted again so that they knew where, we need to, they knew where to go back and look. 
to investigate whether this might have been evidence of a kiln or any other archaeological evidence for that matter. And <clears throat> this gives you a good idea of, the, this is just a small extract from the survey, it revealed another, I think it was about another 12 kiln sites as well as lots of other different kinds of sites. Unfortunately, I don't, don't ask me what all these different symbols denote because I don't know. All I know is that there were an additional 12 kilns were found within Slowden but also some other kinds of sites. And I know for a fact that um, Professor Philford did talk about um, the lovely new forest parchment ware, which is the cream, the light cream coloured new forest ware. And I know that they, defi we, we, they definitely found a kiln where they were producing the parchment ware. I suspect that, was that, 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 that pottery is produ was produced using a very specific seam of clay and maybe this, the kiln was quite close to that, that particular clay source. I'm not sure. That, that would be a suggestion anyway. So, so moving on now to the establishment of New Forest History and Archaeology Group, which was between 2000 and 2005 and 2006. Um, for reasons I won't bore you with, it, it was decided to break from the Hampshire Field Club and set up a separate group. And this is our, our very first report that was published in 2009. Um, by this time, I was a member of the group, and I was because I, I was a member prior to that, when, I, when it was part of the Hampshire Field Club. I'm still a member of the Hampshire Field Club, but I also belong to this group as well. So we're moving on. So this is, this is the, the real history of what's been going on within the group now. So we have spent quite a lot of time checking the LIDAR, looking at the LIDAR. Initially, we did have a little commission from, from Frank to actually do some truthing on it, to see how much, how, how accurate it was at showing up some of the, the New Forest archaeology. So we looked at a, a, a few very small areas. And one thing we learned, wasn't it, that LIDAR doesn't go through holly. <laughs> there were lots of little blanks on it where, the holly, where there were, where were holly trees. But subsequently, of course, wonderfully, the LIDAR has been put completely in the public domain. So the group has subsequently looked at various different aspects of the LIDAR. And this is, this is something, these are some uh, outlined in black here. Oh. These are a couple of barrows, and there were there are ditches around them which were totally imperceptible and not seen before. And Chris Reed, who's one of our members, who is an, a very intrepid um, landscape surveyor, he he actually went out and he was able to just about see that there was this, an imperceptible ditch around these barrows. So that was quite a useful thing. Now now I'm going to move on to some of the excavations which I've taken part in. The group has had an annual excavation almost since its inception in 1961. But um, we haven't ha we've had a few years in recent years when we've missed out because of the complications of getting permission, but that's another story and I'm not going to go there. This is, a, this is one of the first sites that I help, helped excavate, which is um, a Roman road up at Ashley Cross, uh, which is close sort of uh, east of Fording Bridge. Um, I particularly enjoyed this because we could actually, we actually got a chance to, to see the wheel ruts there. And you can see, as uh, Paul Everall was saying, how close the archaeology is to the surface, actually. We didn't have to go down very far to find uh, these wheel ruts. So that was, uh, that was one of our excavations. And um, obviously, my, my interest is in the Roman period as well, so this was particularly interesting for me. This is part of a Roman road that runs sort of from Stony Cross towards Fording Bridge and may well have been one of the roads that was used to transport the Roman pottery. Now, here is another um, aspect of New Forest Earthworks which the group has been very interested in. <clears throat> a few years ago, um, all, something called a, well, these pits were discovered with, with a mound next to them. Now, they, one, one lot was discovered and suddenly they were appearing everywhere in large groups. Um, and you can see part of the reason why they've, uh, they, they are flagged up is because Archaeology shows up particularly well after you've had a had a burning um, session, and this is a on the, at the bottom of Latchmore Valley here. <clears throat> and this is one of our members, Chris Reed, and Jeff Tucker, who's our secretary. They were out to uh, surveying, and with the help of the lidar, uh, the lidar information, and at the end of Latchmore, a number of pit mounds were found. They I put them as an, enig an enigma because nobody really knows what they were for. Um, there have been lots of, uh, 
There's been lots of speculation, and we've done several excavations of pit mounds in various sites. This one at Latchmore we did. We also did um, one which I'm going to talk about later on, and also one which I haven't got photographs of at, at Gawley Bushes. But so far, there's been no indication of what they were for. And this is the pitch pit mound at, at uh, Latchmore under excavation. We got right down to the bottom. All you, can, all you find is a, a lot of yellow clay and a big hole in the bottom, which fills up with water very quickly, I can tell you, because the day after that photograph was taken, we got to the bottom and it rained overnight and it was just a matter of bailing all the water out to start off with. The interesting thing about them that we have managed to discover, though, is that um, <coughs> on this particular site, where there is where a large number of pit mounds, there is also um, a linear feature running across the, the top, across the valley. Now, the linear feature we also excavated and it cuts the pit mounds. Um, so therefore, we know that the linear feature is later than the pit mounds. Well, fortunately, in our excavation, we, managed, we, we, we found some charcoal, which then went off to be carbon dated in New Zealand, because that was the cheapest place. And the, the carbon dating came out as being late Iron Age, Iron Age or, or early, early Roman. So the only conclusion we have been able to come to is that these pit mounds are earlier than that date, which is something at least. <laughs> So um, this is another group of pit mounds. This is the surveying of them. At, these are Ashurst Lodge. Um, <coughs> these, th th this is the place where we excavated in uh, 2012 or 2013. I can't remember which we may have done the surveying earlier on. I think it was 2012 we excavated here. And again, it was very inconclusive. And this is, uh, these are members of the group, um, including our, our supervisor, Tony King here, our chairman. Um, the, the site is there under excavation and it is so interesting I think because there's so little topsoil on top of all these features um, but again it was very inconclusive and we weren't able to find out any more about what the what the site says, was about so, uh, this is a, a more recent excavation we did uh, which was not this year but uh, must have been, not all year before it must have been it was 2015 <coughs> This was um, something that had been identified by the survey team um, who went out and it was, it was hoped it might have been a Bronze Age um, hut, but unfortunately it, we found no evidence to prove that it would have been a Bronze Age hut. So <coughs> it's, it's, it, was, it was all a bit inconclusive, but um, we did have a very nice time doing it and that's, that's one of the ditches that we excavated. Basically we just found a lot of charcoal and um, burnt flint and uh, in fact it was dated, the, the charcoal was dated to the Roman period, um, so, but it is a new site type for the new forest, which is quite good. Possibly because this um, is quite close to uh, the Roman pottery sites, it may be that they were producing charcoal for, for making the pottery, uh, but it's, that's very speculative. Finally, this is our, this year's excavation at New Copse, which is just south of Brockenhurst. Now, this is quite an interesting site because when um, I forgot his name. The gentleman, the speaker this morning, was talking about the ex his excavations at Lee. <coughs> I immediately thought how, how similar the finds were to what they found at New Copse, because um, we've got some Roman box blue tile here, which is most unusual, and a lot of Roman finds. So basically, it was decided to um, excavate this because it was um, <coughs> there were a lot of surface Roman finds. Um, and as our chairman is a Roman Romanist anyway, that was that was a very good opportunity to use his expertise as well. Um, <clears throat> but but it's so what it's shown is that basically uh, there was a massive scatter of lots of Roman material in the trench. Um, we certainly need to do more excavation, and it hasn't been written up yet either. So I've got no idea about what the conclusion is going to be. But there's certainly more more there's certainly more surface finds. The one day when I was there. I managed to pick up another piece of another piece of, uh, I think it was uh, it was Roman roof tile. So whether or not this is a site where they've been reusing material from somewhere else, which is what was suggested by our, our speaker this morning, or whether it's um, some other site where there might be a, have been a Roman villa, is up for speculation. We do need to do more excavation here to see if we can find out a bit more about the site because it is very enigmatic. But the interesting thing I would say is. I saw in that, although the, you wouldn't think this is, it's still not that close to Lee, but actually you can see 
if you just go down the road and around the corner, there's the Isle of Wight ahead of you. So it isn't actually that far from the site at Leap. So um, that's the end of the story about the new place. It's a new place. It's exciting.